the Nine Years Podcast. All right, episode 32 of the Nine Years Podcast, and we could not start it in a happier mood with this song. Stu, have you any ideas what this music is or where it has come from? I haven't got a clue, but it sounds upbeat. It is very upbeat, Stu. It is the entrance music, the theme music for WWE wrestler Sami Zayn. Any ideas why I've decided to go for a wrestler's entrance theme this week? Because wrestling is on, or there's something happening with wrestling? Oh, you say wrestling, something's happening with wrestling. Stu, this is like Advent. We're currently in the season of Advent for wrestling fans. It is WrestleMania season. We are something like 40 days away from the big one, WrestleMania. So I thought every week I might just drop in some wrestling music into the show to celebrate what is easily the best month of the year. Easily. Except for maybe Christmas. I've rendered you speechless with that one. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, is it WrestleMania like 210 or what number is it this time? Or do they not give it a number anymore? Sadly, do you know what? Oh, I'm in two minds whether I need to launch into this little mini rant. But it is WrestleMania 32 this year. But the last couple, this is the second WrestleMania now in a, in a row where they've not actually mentioned the number. Because apparently the owner thinks that by saying the number, it makes it feel old. So they don't like to say it. Which is ridiculous because it's what, Super Bowl like 75,000, whatever it is. Uh, and they are an American company, so you think it wouldn't bother them that much. But there we go. They don't, they don't want to say it's the 32nd WrestleMania, but it is. And I'm very, very... Well, I'm not really that much looking forward to WrestleMania itself. It's more the whole sort of build-up in the month around it. But anyway, happy days. Happy days on this podcast this week, because we've got our John Green interview. We spoke with John Green before the Oxford game last week. John Green, obviously, world-renowned author and YouTube... What's the word for a YouTube what is he, vlogger? Video vlogger, they call, they call him a vlogger. Vlogger, yeah. So, um, John, fantastic person. What a great chat we had with him, and we broadcast the interview in full on today's show. We're also very happy because you're listening, and we thank you very much for downloading the show. Do ask you, if you have downloaded the show on iTunes, and many of you have done this now, just give us a little bit of that rating, five-star rating, on iTunes, maybe a little comment as well as to how much you like the show. Boost our profile. We're also very, very happy because we performed fantastically at Northampton on Tuesday night. Stu, you went. You're still recovering from what was quite a late start for you. In fact, let's start there. What time did you get back from Northampton? Well, yeah, so no, no, we're recording this on Wednesday night because we've had a real timeline. has been all these games, it's all over the players, but I can not think about the, the podcast, did they, and recording it. No, they're quite selfish about uh, like that, actually, I find. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're making sure that we recover well, and when well, they say refuel, and yeah, we're making sure we do that, of course we are. Um, but I got back from Northampton about one o'clock in the morning, um, couldn't sleep, because after a game of that much sort of charged um, adrenaline, it just, yeah, totally, totally, totally buzzing and um, I think it's about 3 o'clock this afternoon before I finally come down and um, hit it all mighty low I feel Northampton performance was fantastic following on from the Oxford defeat now we played very very well against Oxford without getting the perhaps the result we deserved but we took our level of performance into Northampton we didn't let the defeat sort of let our heads drop after it and we performed very very well at six fields would you actually say that we were the better side on Tuesday night yeah, I would do. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm biased because, of course, um, I've got the blue and yellow grasses on. But it was an open game um, from all accounts on Twitter feeds and by um, the background people at Northampton. We're the probably the only team that's gone there in a long while and actually taken a game to Northampton. And and it was encouraging. I think that's the best way to go. I think if we sat there and, you know, sort of said, oh, you come on to us and we're here on the couch, I don't think we'd have done as well. So... Um, I thought it was a brave move by Neil Hardy, but it's symbolic of what he's saying at the moment, that he wants to go and enjoy this this chance to get in the playoffs. And um, I know certainly I enjoyed it. And the, the fans in attendance, I think we probably, I'm not too sure what the official figures was, but I think it's close. It must be in the 400s. We took a decent following to Northampton. I think it was just shy of 400 in the end. Neil Hardy saying about enjoying this great run of form that we're on and this push for promotion. 
key, obviously, without we don't even need to say this, but Lyle Taylor, key in this charge. Good news I hear on the injury front, because he hobbled off, didn't he? He was replaced, he was substituted, he ambled off the pitch with what looked like a heavy knock, but I understand you've spoken to him and it's it sounds all right. Yeah, he's a, he's a great character, though. So, uh, um, he's one of those players, he plays for you, you love him, he plays against you. You're going to want to throw something at him, seriously. Um, yeah, I was um, part of, I was helping out with the um, kit and stuff. Not majorly, but just um, helping out with um, Trevor now on Tuesday night, which is nice of him to allow me to do that and just caught up with the team uh, whilst they were loading the kit on. And um, Lyle come out, wasn't hobbling, asked if he was okay, said he's fine. Um, one of the other group ran there said, you know, you, you two are taking ages to come off. And he went, he goes, I was just kidding inside with a, with a wry smile. And um, he looked fine. Obviously, if any bruising comes up overnight, um, then that could um, put pay to that. But he seems to be walking fine. The only person I see hobbling was Danny Borman. But that's probably just the fact of how much work he got through in the evening. Danny Borman was rested for the Carlisle game. Connor Smith came in. Obviously, I think the intention was then to keep Danny Borman sort of fresh for the Oxford and Northampton games, which were coming in such a short space of time. But are we going to suffer if Danny Borman can't be in every week? Do we lose something when he doesn't play? I think you do. I think you do. I think you lose the experience rather than the legs. You know, Danny Borman's a, a young 37. He's not a person who shows his age very easily. Um, Connor Smith coming in, Got pretty an equal amount of legs, I would say, but I wouldn't say he's got a now sort of a League Two well, they both campaigner. Have two legs. <laughs> In terms of he can get around the pitch, but I think Danny Borman's experience is one that it will be key. So it's important to pay him in the right games to make sure he rests well. Um, he is a medical freak, isn't he? He just um, he defies logic of playing at the level he does, and he put a great shift in with Reeves on Tuesday night and more than matched up the midfield of Northampton that's been taking the league by storm. How was Jake Reeves on Tuesday? Yeah, I'm a big lover of Jake Reeves. Him and Bournemouth worked um, their proverbials off. Um, a lot of stuff was on the counter. We, we, we played an interesting... It was an interesting comment New Ardy was talking about having to play the, the situation and home games, not a secret that we're pitches not performing as we'd like it to perform. Um, and that's no, that's no disrespect to the the excellent ground staff we have, but we are playing two seasons on it to every other one team's playing one season on it because of Kingstone is playing on that pitch. But it was very much to say that the pitch in Northampton, they could trust the bounce of the ball. So we were able to switch, you know, we moved the ball around really quickly and we, I wouldn't say we played on the car attack a lot of time because we took the game to Northampton. But their fullbacks like to get forward, Maloney and Buchanan like to get forward. And what we did was we sort of sacrificed the attacking flair of Andy Bartram and George Frankham, moved him in a little bit, probably didn't play him out as wide, doubled up when we could do, but when we attacked, we hit Lyle Taylor and Tom Elliott into the into the, the channels, really, and, and forced Diamond and Prosser to come out, and they were not comfortable when they were out of their central areas, and that's really where we got the joy, and that was where the game was going to be probably won for us if we were going to win it, and we um, we had a good go. Weak link on Tuesday night was Kelly Roos, I understand. I think it's harsh to say weak link. Um, I think he had a, the goal was, I, I said it, I was doing a, I was doing a nine-year podcast Twitter feed from Sixfield on Tuesday night, and I called it, I thought it was his mistake, and I still stand by that. I've tried to look at some of the footage. It looks like he just gets caught underneath the ball. Um, it's disappointing if you look at where the ball bounces. The ball bounces probably two, three yards from the goal line and we lose the run on a back stick. Not sure who's picking up. Very difficult to see on the on the footage who was assigned to O'Toole. But he did cause us problems in the home game and scored against us then. So I wouldn't say it's the worst thing in the world. But I think, yeah, I wouldn't say Bruce cost us. He didn't cost us a game at all. He made a save from... Um, Sorry, um, James Collins. He made a save from James Collins that was just... He had no right to make it. It was a downward header from six yards. He scooped it off the line and it was a match-winning save of anything. We think about a mistake, though, for a goal and it does seem that we are making too many mistakes at the moment. We even look back to Barnet the previous week where we conceded a very poor goal defensively. 
against Carlisle, we had defensive errors. We got away with it. Oxford, poor defending, it has to be said, for, for both goals. Okay, We need to cut out these mistakes, don't we, if we're going to be realistic playoff challengers? Yeah, we do. And it's, um, it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Because the mistake, Oxford was Sweeney, um, trying to win a ball on a halfway line. He couldn't win. First goal was a throw in at the assistant, um, the linesman, the assistant referee, whatever they call him now, um, failed to pick up that the player was um, was one foot over the line. Well, you say you say this, and Neil Lardy was quite vociferous in his comments after the game, pointing this out that the, the assistant referee had made an error. Can please get in contact with us if you're one of these people? I don't think there's anybody in the stadium that, at the moment, at the time of that goal, were looking at that. Calling, calling for it, suggesting that it was a foul throw. I think at the time I was more concerned with our midfielders not watching the ball when they were running back into position and causing oh, a bit of confusion. Yeah, yeah, agreed. But ultimately, the one person who should be looking at a line is the lines person, lines assistant, lines person, lines assistant, whatever he's called. But he's, <laughs> uh, you're right. You know, the four or thousand people in the ground who shouldn't be looking at a line should be looking. It should be looking on the pitch. But there is one person who really, they're basics. But what I would say is that. It happens quite a lot now. The, foul, the amount of foul throws that you and I called all we the do time. We've got a lot, yeah, we do. There's so many, and it's something that's just been a little bit relaxed. And um, yeah, I suppose you can always say, well, it happens every game, so why is it so important? It's an important game. You know, we're getting to the nitty gritty part of the season, and you expect the officials to make the correct decisions. Um, you can pick, of course, once a once throw is done, Danny Borman never faces up once. He, as if, he's as if he was being warned beforehand. By possibly when they were researching how Oxford played, they had to play the quick throws. So, because Danny Borman, as soon as he made a challenge, was sprinting, but he never faced up, never knew where the ball was, and then it was just a car crash for a goal uh, where Danny Hilton literally tried to roll the ball over the line. It didn't even hit it. It didn't even hit the back of the net. So, probably shouldn't count anyway. But um, is that a new rule we're going to introduce that if it doesn't hit the back of the net, it doesn't? It's not allowed. I don't know about you, but I don't like goals when they don't hit the back of the net. If they just crawl over the line. I'm sort of like, oh, yeah, but it's not really okay. You've got to hear it. You've got to see it hit the back of the net, and, you know, I feel... You've got to really. have that moment, that sort of moment where the ball really does smash into the back of the net when you're stood right behind it. It you does. that real surge of excitement, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it sort of trickles over the line a bit. Like, oh, yeah, it's not really a goal, is it? Mm-hmm. Although, to be fair to the football gods that are listening, of course, on the other podcast, if we happen to score a goal that just crossed the line at Wembley in May, I would cheer and take the rewards that come with it. Absolutely, definitely. Week as a whole, then, we've ended up with one point out of six. I uh, Possibly not what we were looking for, but we should be happy with two good performances, though, shouldn't we? Ignoring the fact that, and even saying that, to be fair, one point out of six, but we're still, what, one point outside the playoffs with games in hand. Yeah, well, we're sort of halfway through this sort of mini little league of games, aren't we, now? So we've... We've played the top two teams. Oxford now went second after Tuesday. Um, so we've played the top two teams now. And I I was looking forward to these games coming up, but I was also a little bit apprehensive to see actually whether we were, um, whether we can match the performance levels because Oxford, record-wise, not great, but I wasn't too sure. Northampton, yeah, their run's amazing, but we were we were two top form teams going into it. But coming out this, I've come out from Tuesday night and proper thinking... If that's all you've got, then I'm I'm not worried massively, and we are probably in the league now. We're not. Well, you shouldn't be. In a, you shouldn't be in a league table, a fourth league position. But you sometimes wonder, are you, can you get any further? But I've looked at that reasonably confident. So I think we had a, I think we had a really good week. I think we've we've proved to ourselves we belong in that company. Um, performance wise, we had great performances. It is a results. It is that sort of time of the season where it's results orientated. But we haven't lost any ground. And if you look at the league table now, going into the game on the weekend against Accrington, we're just outside the playoffs. But in the three teams above us, all on goal difference at a point above. So it's a great opportunity to bring Accrington into the mix. They lost at Yeovil in the week. Their form's starting to drop a little bit. So are they starting to feel the pressure all of a sudden? Who knows? Who is your hero of the week then for us? Across both games, I'm going to go for Tom Elliott, I think. He's finally now realising what we need from him, um, what service he needs to provide for us. Probably, if he's being truthful, he's probably, the, he's probably now actually looking that he's actually properly match fit because um, he hasn't played a strong string of games 
But now he's starting to get into that. Him and Lyle Taylor work so well, um, but complement each other really well. And um, the, only, the only funny thing is he's, he's not come up with a goal in, in the games, but ultimately he's done enough to to really put a, a, a solid shift in. And um, the goals will come. You keep working hard and playing the way he is, he get goals. But Tom Elliott is my um, hero of the week. Villain of the week. Lions person at Oxford. Lions person. I, I love this new name you've given them. The what, assistant referees. What are they called? Assistant referees? Yeah, assistant referees. Yeah, they're they're or, taking lines persons, aren't they? Linesmen. Why lines persons? Because, I don't know, because it could be a female that might turn up one week. But it wasn't a female. It was a male. So it's a linesman. Yes, but, yeah, it's true. But we do have lady female. Lady female? We do have lady <laughs> lines people. Lady so, lines people. Isn't that just as bad? Why don't you say lines lady? Lines lady. It sounds like she's going to hang out in Washington, doesn't she? It's like, to me. Well, because well, the word lady. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, well done, yeah that's like, we have lots of lady listeners, and um, I could just hear a few of them now just thinking, wait until I see him on Saturday. But of course, I'm not sexist. They've all got a place for football, and we have many, many ladies who turn up. To be, and to be fair, window. they probably didn't hear that bit over the sound of the dishes sort of clacking and clinking together in the in the washing up bowl. <laughs> uh, I think you're not getting me in trouble anymore than what I can dig a hole for myself. Very true, um, I have to do that. No, exactly. Before we get on to our John Green interview, I th- will now mention our teaser for this week. So whilst we sit back and listen to the fantastic John Green, you can be thinking about an answer to this one, Stu, okay? We've got okay. Bristol Rovers next Tuesday. We will see you next Tuesday, Bristol Rovers. <laughs> and I was just thinking about the various managers that have taken the hot seat at the Memorial Stadium uh, since we returned to the Football League in 2011. Obviously, Terry Brown was in charge of us when we first played Bristol Rovers in our first game back in the Football League. My question is, who was the manager of Bristol Rovers that day? And who else has managed Bristol Rovers in our encounters against them since then? There have been... Okay, they've had five managers. I think we've come up against four of them, okay, in games that we've played against them. That makes sense? Hmm. I ain't got a clue. I reckon you can put... Yeah, I, bet you, I, I think you can work out the very first one. But I'll I, remember, you, I remember the, I remember the occasion. I remember the occasion because it was our... It was on Sky, wasn't it? Sky recorded it. Is that, the reason, is that the reason you remember it, Stu? Not the first game <laughs> back in the Football League. Not the special <laughs> kit we wore. Not the <laughs> nine too. years thing coming round full circle. No, no. That was when we were on Sky. Well, yeah, because I just, yeah, I don't know why I thought it was on Sky, but I just remember it was a bit of an occasion, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it was first game back in the football league. <laughs> bit of an occasion. Oh, uh, dear, yeah. Understate, understatement of the year. Yeah, right? never, won, never won to understate matters, was it? Yeah. That Second World War, that was a bit of a skirmish, wasn't it? Oh. <laughs> I can't, I'm just trying to think, that's quite... Managers of Bristol Rovers. Yeah, well, I'll leave, you, I'll leave you to think about that one whilst we listen to John Green, OK? So we spoke to John Green before the Oxford game. What an absolute delight he was. Spoke about many things, obviously a lot about Wimbledon, his history supporting English football, and also bits and pieces here about his books and his films, and also, very importantly, his charity work that he's been doing, busy, very, very busy this week doing. So we had a great time with John, Stu, myself, and my brother Chris interviewing. So those are the voices you'll be hearing. And let's get to it. So, John, you've flown in for the Oxford game today. More of a, a layover than sort of a, a big trip or a holiday or anything like that. Um, what time did you get in today, this morning? Uh, we just got in at uh, 8.30. And then I saw you guys at the cafe uh, <laughs> breakfast. The World Famous Fat Boys Cafe. The World Famous Fat Boys Cafe. And then uh, we leave this evening... Uh, um, Rosiana, my production partner, and I are actually going to Jordan to visit uh, refugee camps uh, where Syrian refugees are living in Jordan. Uh, so we'll be doing that for a few days, and then I'll be back home. But uh, this is a very welcome layover. I am so excited. <laughs> and I've lucked into a really important game. Uh, so it should be uh, exciting, if a little terrifying. I think we're all a little bit nervous ahead of today's game. It is a big day, obviously. We've currently fit, got ourselves up to fifth in the league somehow, playing Oxford today, who are up in third. So it is a a huge game. We weren't really expecting to be in the mix at this stage, if we're being honest. No. Have you been? What have you sort of made of our season so far? Like, well, you know, I have to. 
I have to say something about, I have a podcast too, uh, Dear Hank and John, and it, it, we bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. It's not as <laughs> AFC Wimbledon focused as the, the Nine Years podcast, but um, we do have a little AFC Wimbledon bit at the end. And I started out the, the season sort of trying to prepare the listeners for uh, sort of a lengthy campaign in which a, a finish of 16th is is good news, you know? So yeah, like just, we were all yeah. feeling that. Just this, this uh, you, you try to introduce an American sports audience to the idea that it isn't all about winning. Sometimes it's about finishing a solid 16th. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... <coughs> And then suddenly this has happened. I have no idea what to make of it. It's just amazing. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's been wonderful. And I now I am, I mean, I am properly dreaming. I'm not just dreaming of the playoffs. I'm dreaming of third. Yeah, a win today and we could be really pushing up, challenging for a top three space. It's hard not to think about it. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's it, at the same time, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. I'm so excited. And it's been so fun to watch and see all the excitement, um, even just watching the YouTube highlights and, and following along on Twitter. It's incredibly exciting. Like, I, I mean, and also the great run that the uh, youth uh, side went on in the FA Youth Cup, I thought was just really special. Those kids are great. And they, I think, say so much about the values of the club and the values of this community and, so I was really proud of them. So it's just been an awesome season. Because they made a video for your lad, I think, didn't they? Didn't yeah, they, they made a great va- a great video for Henry. Henry didn't understand what they were saying. It was very, <laughs> it was very British Sandwich. English, you yeah. know? Um, but Rosiana translated for him. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he was delighted. He was like, is that for me? And I was like, I think so, man. Yeah, I think it's for you. Uh, no. So were you aware about the academy uh, before the, the Chelsea game? Were you aware about? Because you're looking in here, we're in the academy room now. Yeah, and you can see obviously we go from under nine straight through to the under eighteen. Were you aware of that when you? Yeah, yeah. So when I first talked to Ivor about the possibility of sponsoring the club, um, he told me about the academy, and I know how important academies are to um, uh, to in, in, to English football and English clubs. Um, I didn't know how good the academy was, both on the uh, boy side and on the girl side. It must be said, um, but yeah. It's, uh, and then when I watched. Uh, via Twitter, um, the incredible win against Newcastle with uh, South London's ginger messy Alfie Egan scoring two <laughs> goals. It was pretty special. It was quite amazing, actually. We played Chelsea down here and we got, what, three and a half thousand, didn't we? Yeah. Four. Um, and I think at the time, the first team were doing really, really well. Um, but I think it's like nothing better sometimes than seeing your own kids come through. Yeah. Um, There's something really special about those players who've come up through the youth academy and now play... Um, uh, play for the first team side, and uh, Wimbledon has an uncommon number of those players. So I think they've done a great job with youth development, and um, and also I think Neil's been great about signing the best best prospects to pro contracts. Definitely, we've been very lucky in the past to have such a good youth setup that we're lucky now to have reset up with AFC Wimbledon because there was obviously a gap between the Milton Keynes debacle and then yeah. Chelsea again. But to get it back up to this level and have Sweeney playing every week is amazing. Yeah. Will one one of my favorite, yeah, Will Nightingale's yeah. great. One of my favorite, favorite Wimbledon stories is Simon Bassey not being good enough for Wimbledon FC's uh, youth yeah, team yeah. and getting kicked mm-hmm. out of the club when he was 16 and then trying out on, uh, you know. Now, now he's here and we can't get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> now he's here ever since. Now he's here for life. <laughs> I, I love Simon Bassey. Yeah. To be fair, we go well with Simon Bassey, but when he first joined, he joined the NFC the trials, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And to be fair, he spent more time kicking players, didn't he? Than he did really kicking balls. He was good at that. <laughs> yeah. He's, he never scored, as I recall. No. I yeah. think in his last game, he was given a penalty that he did missed dramatically. I think towards, <laughs> towards the end of his... Towards the end of the season, I think we had a, we had a semi final. We were five 0 up against Coney Hall at Sutton. We got a penalty, yeah. and we let Bass take it. We thought, right, Bass, here's your chance. You're going <laughs> to score is. now. And I think it's still travelling now. <laughs> <laughs> you might, yeah, on the podcast, you might talk about the ball being found on Mars. I'm going to the field now. But he's a great link from when we started. We started into non-league and it's still here now. And doing a really good job as well yeah we, yeah we said at the time didn't we it'd be great to have a link from those combined counties days to follow us through to the football league and the fact that Simon Bassey is that man is, yeah it's fantastic it just keeps that as Stu says keeps that link and just yeah. someone to, to be able to tell that story um, so that the you know the players who are here now know about the club's history I think the club does a great job with that in general they, they all get it. all the new players get a talk before the season starts anybody who joins they get pulled into the office and they get told the whole story yeah. From start to finish. Yeah. It's brilliant that they do that. 
That's great. Yeah. That's great. It's important too because you don't want them um, saying, you know, saying the wrong thing. thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a certain ex goalkeeper has. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> got that wrong. Or remain nameless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's where it um, was got better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, John, just for listeners that may not know, then, you are the world famous author of uh, The Fault in Our Stars and Paper Towns, amongst a number of other books as well. And you sponsor a stand here at King's Meadow, which I think. It's at the John Green stand? Is it that is, the one? Yeah. Right, okay, good. Yeah, that's that the one. one. Good. Okay. So um, this all became because you became a fan of the club. Did you become a fan of the club through your work with the, on FIFA with your YouTube videos? Is that how you first sort of became the link with us? And if so, my understanding is you fell upon Wimbledon as we were the lowest ranked team on <laughs> FIFA. Is that the reason it was, we were chosen? <clears throat> No. Um, uh, so I actually, I actually followed the club a little bit before the, before the 2011 uh, run through the um, conference. conference yeah. um, just because I knew the story of what had happened and I was, you know, everybody on the internet or like hardcore soccer fans on the internet, not everybody on the internet, it's a very small <laughs> group of people, but hardcore soccer fans on the internet um, have always liked the story of Wimbledon because it is a fan, you know, it's a story of fans winning essentially um, in a, in a game where a lot of times it feels like fans are powerless. And uh, so I'd followed it a little bit. And then when the game, when the playoff final happened in 2011, incredible drama, you know, you have your captain and never played a game of league football in his life, score a penalty to, it's a pretty amazing story. Two penalties saved by your 19 year old, goalkeeper it's just the whole thing it's just like you know yeah. out of a movie or yeah, something it is. yeah Hollywood script, yeah. yeah and um and so that was when I became a fan at the time I was playing uh FIFA as Swindon because for a totally random reason I played my brother and I remembered that Swindon had beaten Arsenal like 35 years before and he wanted to be <laughs> Arsenal and I wanted to show him that I could beat him as Swindon but then I started thinking you know this is weird to have this advertising money from my uh, FIFA playing because I upload the videos to YouTube and the people watch them and it's weird to have it like go to me uh, you know my books are becoming more successful and that was like less of a concern and I really got attracted to this idea that I could play a video game with fictional characters that would generate real money for the real version of that club <laughs> um, and I thought about doing it with Swindon at first but then I thought you know it, you know Swindon's just, uh, like a pretty typical English football club and that it's owned by, you know, a guy who's rich. Um, and mm-hmm. thought this would be a really cool thing to do with Wimbledon because, you know, they're a fan owned club. And then from there, it just got worse and worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it snowballed from there. Or better and better, and depending on your point of view. Depending <laughs> how you look at it. Yeah. So was your plan always along, along the lines of looking and getting the logo on the shorts or did it just... No. <laughs> was no, it, no. Was it was like a crazy project? <laughs> no, no, no. Got in. I never imagined. I mean, I can't explain to you how surreal it is. Every single time I'm playing FIFA, and they scroll at the beginning of the game, they always <laughs> scroll up the players from behind. Like the, you see, you see the Wimbledon socks. They scroll up, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> uh, it is an absolute delight to be the back of short sponsor to be able to sponsor the liminal space between the buttock and thigh <laughs> of AFC Wimbledon's brilliant players. There is an irony there. I will leave it. That's um, going to be awesome. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I never imagined that. But yeah, I recalled and he said, is this something that you'd be interested in? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> so now if you look at you've got obviously the, um, the pitch side advertising as well, which is quite old nerd fights is on there. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's all with a stand. Is that where you're going to fish? With a stand? I think, I mean, barring... Um, Barring some kind of great financial success in my life, um, I don't think that my wife will allow me to devote more of our children's future <laughs> to sponsoring Wimbledon. But I love, I mean, I love doing it and it uh, it's so meaningful for me. And also, I mean, I think it's good for book sales. I mean, you guys probably don't read a lot of young adult novels in a year, um, but... Maybe I can convince you to read mine. So I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've read, I've read um, Full Nut Stars. There you go. Yeah. There and I watched some Spots of Film, obviously. So that's 80, that was 80 cents to me. So yeah, well, there I'm, you go. Get, yeah. I'm getting back. <laughs> yeah, so you, read, you love the books as well. <laughs> oh, thank you. So that's 360. There we go. Yeah. You're doing all right. Yeah, that's 320. <laughs> I must say, I loved it. We watched Four Stars and I loved it. Absolutely thank you. loved it. Um, we also went to the premiere of Paper Towns. Yeah. How'd that come about? Uh, yeah, Women of Odium. 
I, that was I, it was just mostly Ivor. Um, I you know I he's think Chris Wainsett man. Yes, he's Chris Wainsett. But I also think after the London premiere of the Fall of Our Stars, uh, all the Fox people were like, "What is this thing that you do?" And I was like, "Oh, I sponsor this team AFC Wimbledon. They're great. You should read their story. It's an amazing, amazing story." And um, so they were they they got excited about it too. So it was a great opportunity to bring. To, I just desperately wish I I could have been there, but it was a great opportunity to bring together kind of two worlds that matter to me. So when can we look forward to the screenplay for the Wimbledon story? I'm going to be doing that. I would love I, I mean, I would love, love, love to, I mean, oh, you to see that, that as a movie. It would, it's an amazing story. <laughs> I actually think that it is. It's a special story, and it's a, um, it's, it's a story about, we like, we live in this corporate age where corporations are seen as all-powerful, or wealth is seen as all-powerful, where, where it feels like uh, money matters more than humans. And the Wimbledon story is a story that just disproves that, that just said that there's a group of people who repeatedly, even when they were offered, you know, opportunities to get big investment from, uh, from outside, just said, no, we're going to, we think we can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, I don't even think, I actually, are, I've seen some old clips of, uh, like right after the club was formed. Okay. Of like the most sort of like dreamy eyed hardcore fans being like, you know, in like fifteen or twenty years we could be back in the football league. Mm. That's pretty much what it was like. Yeah. But it only took nine years. <laughs> it only took nine. Standing on hay bales watching on, on pitch on community pitches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were we were all doing it and it was just the most peculiar it's just surreal. It, surreal. it was a weird story happening. We sort of we got to a playoff season. <coughs> and we, we last ten games we were think unbeaten, I think, for the playoffs. We were saying cheer, wasn't it? Is this Teams that are on form normally win playoff finals. But you don't believe you're going to get back into the football league. You just, you know, you've got a chance, but it's that when I think when it happened, I think we all, we all shed a tear, didn't we, in the City Manchester Stadium? And yeah. um, some, some of us spunked off work to go. <laughs> I mean, that's a great decision. <laughs> that was a brilliant decision. I don't think anybody I mean, on earth would ever regret <laughs> missing a day of work to go to that game. <laughs> yeah, no. then I got in trouble for it. Oh, we don't talk about that again. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah well, cool. I mean, yeah, I. It is that was one of the greatest. I mean, to me, like that's one of the greatest moments in English in English football. I mean, because it's uh, precisely because it was you know here's this club that had been it, the English FA explicitly stated was its existence was not in the wider interest of football, and there is no bigger. I don't know. Can you believe the podcast? No. You oh, can do. Yes, oh, yeah. he, he so does regularly. Yeah, there no, is no bigger. F- you in the world <laughs> than being like, well, not only are we in the wider interests of football, but here we f-ing are again. Yeah, like, you, now you have to f-ing deal with us it. again. <laughs> I was at the, uh, when I went to the Liverpool game, uh, I was seated at a table um, and I was talking to Dave Besant, which was freaking yeah, awesome. Um, yeah. I just bought his son for my FIFA team. Um, <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah. Uh, it was, I'm just kidding. He's good. He's good. He's good. Uh, and I was, I, I bought him, uh, anyway, so I was talking to Dave Besant, uh, just like to hear all, all those stories about the FA Cup final true, like that you guys were drunk. And he was like, I wasn't drunk. Because I'd take a bike at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, you might want to cut that. Uh, anyway, so and I and then and then I was talking about like, about, but just about the story and how amazing it was and how amazing it must be for him, you know, to have like to have seen the highest of the highs, the lowest of the lows, the feeling that this, you know, this club that I was such a huge part of their history isn't going to exist anymore, and then to see. Here we are playing Liverpool in the FA Cup, just like 1989, and uh, and I was just being very hard on the on the English FA to find out that the guy sitting next to me was the FA representative uh, at the at the game, and he was like, "Well, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Some like poor thirty year old, you know, like yeah, young. Exactly. It still, still amazes me how an FA an FA can come out and say something like that in a club. It's just." Um, but then it's like, it, it, it basically antagonised us, didn't it? And made us want to yeah, prove everybody. We're not bitter. Everybody wrong. <laughs> Still remember it very well. Yeah. yeah. But as you say, it gave, it, gives us, it gave us that sort of drive just to say, like, we're going to prove, as you say, you know, prove you wrong. But there's some, you know, usually righteous indignation fades quickly. Like, it usually, um, I feel like anger burns bright but doesn't burn for long. 
Um, and so it had to be a mix of anger and love. Like it had to be a mix of like, yes, fear, fury at this decision, but also, you know, I, that, that you guys loved going, you loved being Wimbledon fans and you weren't going to stop being Wimbledon fans. Mm. It's a unique experience. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. no two ways about it. <laughs> so you, you mentioned there sort of the FA Cup final. And we're talking about the conference being a, one of those great moments in English football history. And we do have to say that possibly in 1988, it was another one of those most famous moments in English football history when we won the FA Cup, obviously beating Liverpool. And that's how you first became involved with the English football, I believe, through through support of Liverpool. Yeah, so I grew up a Liverpool supporter. Um, I remember that game. <laughs> uh, I, I was a kid, but... Uh, and and. There was very little football coverage in um, in the U.S. at the time, but I was a soccer player, um, and so we would get tapes of games and stuff um, and watch them, and then, of course, just be blown away as yeah. a different sport being played over <laughs> here than what we were playing in the <laughs> ground. <laughs> well, unless you watch us, of course. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> not, not, Maybe not. Yeah, not back in But, yeah, it was... So, I, uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I... Definitely have a lot of fond memories as a Liverpool supporter. And on that day, when Liverpool played Wimbledon, uh, I was here for the game. And it was a it was a weird feeling, for sure. I mean, it never, never occurred to me that these two interests of mine would come into conflict. <laughs> it seemed impossible. But, um, yeah, I found, I mean, for better or worse, I found myself rooting for Wimbledon on the day. So you say you played soccer at school? Yeah. So until until I was, like, <laughs> well, sort of... Uh, mid there was I mean so in American soccer at the time I was this is like 10 year olds uh, there was a sort of a fourth it was essentially a 4-4-2 um, but sort of with a diamond uh, four and I either played the right or left um, part of the diamond but I was exceptionally bad so I was so the, <laughs> I was the player that um, my coach would always ring in um like I would usually start the games but I'd get subbed off at halftime and I would start the games and then in, at halftime the coach would be like do you want to know why I started green because he's he sucks but he tries <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like I was the one who was there to motivate the other yeah, players they were like look at how hard that guy's trying despite how terrible he is <laughs> Having flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were playing the right midfield, you were playing the right of the diamond, you were probably playing the George Franklin role. As <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're saying these words, I'm thinking, a lot of our listeners right now are going, George Franklin, George Franklin, George Franklin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't have any any of uh, George Franklin's ability to get up and down the pitch, though. So, so in terms of social media, you, do you follow... Because George Franklin is obviously George Franklin at the moment. He's a... He's a player my women fans sort of love to hate at the moment. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you follow that on the social media side? Have you picked up that impression? What's your What's your thoughts on, on George Frank in the season? Well, I mean, look, I haven't seen him play. So, I, mean, I, I, I you know, my general thought is that it's hard enough to be a professional football player without people talking bad about you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, and I, I feel this as a Liverpool fan too, like our goalkeeper, Simon Minouet, is under a tremendous amount of negative attention. And I actually don't think that a lot of the problems that the club are having are, are directly attributable to him. I think a lot of what happens is that it's such a team game. And um, if in a one-on-one -on -one situation, somebody gets beat, somebody, you know, does something wrong, that gets so noticed. But the things that they do off the ball, you know, to, to pull defenders away, whatever, none of that stuff ever gets noticed because it's, you know, it's, it's sort of tactical minutia of football. Um, I, I mean, all I can say is that he's great for me on FIFA. He's an absolute <laughs> star. Very good, isn't he? he whips the ball into mm -hmm. the box beautifully. He scores quite a bit. Um, we call him Frankenstein, um, and I'm very <laughs> fond of him. Yeah, 10 assists this season, isn't it? So. Double figures with assists this season, yeah. Not um, bad. You do have some very strange nicknames for some of the yeah. players. <laughs> yeah. Um, gonna, however, <laughs> I do like the Shea LaBeouf. Shea LaBeouf, yeah. yeah. Coming out. <laughs> and I like, if, if it, listeners, do try and watch some of these videos because they are hilarious when they're playing. And you do shout your name an awful lot. Yeah, I do. Well, because both my strikers are named John Green. Uh, so that is a weird 
thing that I have to do. I have to shout my name when I'm excited because I've just, I, some version of me has just scored a goal. But I, I have to say at the moment, our two best goal scorers are not, not John Green or John Green. Our, our two best goal scorers are, um, Autobiok and Fenwa and, uh, Lyle Taylor, who we call the Montserratian and Messi. Yep. Um, he's just an amazing, amazing goal scorer. And, and he has been an amazing goal scorer for, for Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, I noticed the uh, you dug out the Montserratian song the other week. Yeah, I found Which the Montserratian <laughs> national anthem. Actually, the Montserratian national anthem is "God Save the Queen." It's, yeah, uh, but they have a national song. Um, it's yeah, I don't know if that's what they play before games, but it's I not. Think, I think uh, a dirge is probably something. Yeah, that it's a bit it. of a bit of a funeral dirge, as national songs go. Yeah. Well, last time is anyone we've really got a decent song for at the moment, isn't it? We, um, yeah. We seem to go through a stage where we have some we have some decent songs with Danny Cad, Danny Cadwell and sure. and stuff like that. We're working on new songs now, aren't we, for um, for players? But what Lyle, are you have for a while. Um, Lyle Taylor is on um, Lyle Taylor Baby, isn't it? Um, yeah. It goes on the Human League song. The Human don't League song. Want, don't, you want, don't you want me, baby? That one. So it goes, Lyle Taylor, baby, Lyle Taylor, whoa. Okay. Um, that was, we were all just waiting to see which one of us was going to be the one to sing. <laughs> yeah, so well, I, I, I could tell that yeah. one of you wanted to sing no, it. No, I mean, we all hope that you're singing it in a few hours. Oh, we will be in a few hours. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Cheers, guys. That's all right. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I noticed that your, your Aziz is the same as our Aziz, because you just say Aziz very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. So I noticed that you played 4 4 2. Uh, on FIFA, I do. Did you try the um, new idea? The season was famous for starting with a three-four-three. Did you try and follow suit at all with him? Yeah, that was the like default. Um, I'll tell you what I like about the three-four-three in FIFA with Wimbledon is that uh, there is there the FIFA Wimbledon have way too many strikers. Um, and not nearly enough defenders. <laughs> so three four three makes sense. Ironic, <laughs> just in terms of who you have available to you. Um, so yeah, it makes sense because it's good. You know, then you can start Lyle Taylor and Akinfenwa and Aziz or uh, T. S. Eliot, Tom Elliott. I guess that's his real name. Um, like that. So that's nice. Yeah. And on, I'm a big FIFA player as well. But what would you on FIFA 17? What would you love to see added? If you could add anything to FIFA 17, what would you... So I have a theory about this, which is that like FIFA 11 through 14 were all um, criticized for not being enough like real soccer. And then um, FIFA 16 came out, and it was like much more like real soccer, which yeah. also made it somewhat less fun. But that same year, real soccer changed... And it went back to this weird world where all you need is pace on the wings. Uh, yeah. Like Leicester City are going to win the Premier League because they have three fast players. Yeah. So I think FIFA needs to change back to what is now real soccer, which is just how fast can you run down the sideline? <laughs> I must be back to that triangle button. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah, just hold, hold that button hold and push good. forward and then hit X and you score. That's pretty much every FIFA I had as a kid. I think it's will be unplayable on FIFA. It is. It's all about pace, definitely. Yeah, no, I agree. Quick five questions? Yeah. You all right? Definitely. We've got... Just a few either or choices if we throw at you for you to choose for us. Great. Are you two, you know. Do you want me to? You go. Yeah. You, you two can go. This. Um, well, right, Chris. Do you want to? Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's the first one answer that comes to your head. So, first off, Cop or John Greenstand? Oh, John Greenstand. Excellent. Stephen King or Stephen Gerrard? Stephen Gerrard. You do that one. Okay. So one of my, okay. This is my one. Yeah. Cara Delevingne uh -huh. or Jamie Carragher. <laughs> Good lord. Jamie Carragher. <laughs> Kirk or Picard? Oh god, that's incredibly yeah. difficult. Come on, Picard. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, Colin Baker or Tom Baker? Tom Baker. Yeah. Good answer. And finally, Terry Pratchett or Terry Brown? Oh, that's hard. I mean, I've got to go with Terry Pratchett. He's a legend in my business. Yeah. <laughs> it's Terry. acceptable. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So, so, so again, with your with your books and that, um, when I went to film, how did you find that? Because I know you were on set, weren't you? When it was being, how did you find your films being put on? They were both really books. positive experiences. I think that sometimes it isn't for authors. Sometimes it can be difficult. And in fact, like I've had other books that didn't end up getting made into movies, but were like in different parts of the process where it's been extremely frustrating and not fun. Um, but both of those movies were so fun, and I. I really do love the kids who are in them. And I think the you know, the pleasure for me is just in knowing that I get to root for those 
young people for the rest of their careers. And I was just, in fact, Nat Wolf, who star of Paper Towns, is also in Fall Night Stars. Just a few days ago, Rosiana and I got to go see him in a, in a play in New York, and he was so great. And, and yeah, it's just, um, it's been a really positive experience. Um, and plus, it's, you know, obviously great for the books. Because from what YouTube food I see, you genuinely seem to bond with the people that are playing those parts. Uh, yeah, and that's rare. I think it's rare for authors to get on set at all, or maybe for longer than a day. It's rare still for authors to genuinely like the movies. I mean, I can't imagine having to go on a press junket for two months, which is plenty dehumanizing. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's a first world problem, but it's not, not much fun <laughs> to, to, to do that stuff. Uh, but... It's a lot more fun when you can at least uh, stand behind the stuff that's been made. If I'd had to like go and sell something I didn't like, it would have been brutal. And I saw on one of them you were doing a promotion, I think it was for Your Stars, on, in, in Manhattan. It was part of Google, and you looked truly amazed by the amount of fans there. How did you find How did you... You looked like you, yeah. you just looked totally sort of like blown away with it. How did you find all that? I mean, it's so weird. Like, you know, my, my most of my life is spent in my basement, either making YouTube videos in my basement or writing in my basement. And I'm a pretty, uh, you know, introverted guy. And, uh, you know, and I, I actually, I I remember what I was thinking then. Um, what I was thinking, I was thinking back to this book signing I'd done many, many years ago with, uh, Stephanie Meyer, the author of Twilight. And it was right as Twilight was becoming a big phenomenon and there were like 70 people in the bookstore. It was the most people I'd ever seen in a bookstore by like 68. And, uh, <laughs> and there were like, you know, three or four kids there for me. And the rest of them were there for Stephanie. And the kids who were there for me were like really nice kids. And they were, you know, normally dressed. And the kids who were there for Stephanie had like handmade T-shirts where they'd scrawled in Sharpie their favorite lines from the book and their favorite ca- stuff about their favorite characters. I just remember thinking... You know, I just don't write those kinds of books, and that's a bummer because I would really like to. I wish I did. Like I wish that it connected with readers the way that that that, that did. And I remember that is what I was thinking in that moment. I was looking out and I saw a girl who had a handmade T-shirt on, and I was just like, "Who would have thought that?" <laughs> <laughs> so, who would have been your favorite authors then when you were younger? Then your younger days, who would you? Who would, whose books were you reading? Um, well, when I was a teenager, I was really into J.D. Salinger's book, mm-hmm. Catcher in the Rye. I love this book, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Yeah, my, actually away. a favorite of mine, yeah. Yeah, a favorite of mine, too. Um, and, uh, and then I also read, uh, I was from Florida, and there's a Florida author named Zora Neale Hurston who wrote a novel called Their Eyes Were Watching God that was really important to me when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I was a big fan of Toni Morrison. She was the American novelist who won the Nobel Prize when I was in high school. So it was kind of, like, exciting you know, when I was in high school to think that there was this like great novelist, this like major novelist writing now being, you know, recognized now that was exciting. Um, but I read really broadly too. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I read all kinds of stuff. I never read much, uh, uh, English wit. I have to say, (laughs) so I'm woefully undereducated. I've read Jane Austen and, uh, the Brontes, um, and I've read a fair bit of Shakespeare, but it doesn't go back much further than that. Yeah, true. There's, there's an author, Niall Cooper, you might have heard of him. I want to read a couple of his books. Oh, yeah, Niall read. Cooper? Niall Cooper, yeah. All right. I'll have a look out for him. All right, All right. I'll check it out. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> 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 might have done a few history of Wimbledon books. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Did he do This Is Our Time? He did, he did. Yeah, yeah. He did that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible book. Yeah. Almost sit and read that in a day. You laugh and cry. Yeah. And Takes you on it and the memories book. that come flowing back to you. Yeah. I bet. Fantastic. I bet. What's in the pipeline for you then in a minute with your writing? What's current projects? Or anything I'm like? trying to write a new book. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, my goal is to try to finish something this year um, so that it can come out next year. It's been four and a half years almost since The Fall of Our Stars came out. Um, and a lot of stuff has happened in that time that kept me from writing. Um, but I'm finally back to it, which feels great. So this is sort of like a brief interruption, um, uh, this trip and then the trip to Jordan, um, you know, important things that I really, really want to do, but then I'm excited to go back to writing and then hopefully won't have any more major interruptions until, uh, May 7th (laughs) when the, uh, when the season ends and, uh, we will then secure automatic promotion. Is that that a day I'm trying not to (laughs) Is that a day I'm trying? Well, I have to buy to book flights. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I got to think think ahead of the game. game. Yeah. You know, we, we started we started the podcast and we come to the end of it and we were talking about the 
you know, he, he picked the right time to join here in terms of to come today and see the game. Um, I must admit, if any Tuesday nights to go by, it was proper nerve wracking, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, good, yeah. I think it was one of those times when actually it become real when you can get into a plow. So I think the atmosphere today would be very tense all the fall today, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, I hope it is intense, but I feel like inevitably it will be, you know? Like, um, but I, I, the reason I hope it is intense is because, like, who would have realistically thought this would happen? Well, exactly. Like, it's crazy yeah. fifth place in March. Yeah. It's the, it's the busiest time of the season, as they say. Do you know what I mean? We've got yeah. 15 games to go now. Our Oxford record isn't great. I don't know if anyone's told you about the record against Oxford. Yeah, not great. Not great. Not, not scored great. a goal yet. So we're hoping that with you here to... Changing today. <laughs> yeah, you're going to change. Got that American optimism. <laughs> Next time. And, the- <laughs> 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 and how, do you, how do you catch up with games? Do you listen to it on the Radio WDON at all? Or? Yeah, so I listen to Radio WDON and then I, I uh, watch the YouTube highlights and uh, then follow along on Twitter. At Nine Years Podcast. You've done this before. We, um, we travel with Mikey C and, and Rob and that. Yeah. Um, how would you fancy going and joining them with co commentary? Oh, uh, I'm not good enough. <laughs> They're great, though. I mean, like, I, whenever I talk about the club, I always talk about their, their commentary because I just think it's so great. It's, and there's something about it that's self aware, you know, like mm-hmm. when, uh, when the quality of play is bad, they're willing to embrace it. I remember one time, uh, they were uh, they were tweeting about this Arsenal game in the Champions League. Arsenal were just playing terribly, and they took a penalty that you know went seven hundred feet above the goal. And <laughs> they, they they tweeted uh, at, at Arsenal, uh, "If you want to see if you want to see that kind of football, come to South London any Saturday." <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, I did a co-commentary with them just once uh, at Milton Keynes, which yeah. was an interesting. Experience. Oh yeah, I bet. And that was very, and that was the time we won. So that was good fun. Yeah, um, but it was very difficult because you're not allowed to say any not allowed player to say names, case, and it's very difficult. There's that poor kid who I kind of feel bad for who signed the contract when he 15 years ago <laughs> yeah. and still yeah. gets booed and is like one of the most hated. He was just a child. He was a child, but he should have learned. <laughs> <laughs> I must you both did that. Thing. You did the. Um, I did, did, did the press box press press night as well. Yeah, and it was a. Oh, it was a hor- I, I phoned Stu from behind the scenes at Milton King, behind enemy lines. Uh, horrendous experience. A horrendous experience, but. Oh, I mean, the all, all, all things about the club aside, it's just a terrible place to watch football as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Just, well, cause not it's just like because it's like an empty 20,000-seat oh, stadium. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there's, I mean, the things that they say are just... Mm-hmm. Just... Unprintable. <laughs> they're just too ludicrous. I mean, you can't... I don't know, whatever. I, uh, to me, like, to me, you've given the fact that you have no moral high ground on which to stand. Just acknowledge that. In fact, the only thing they sing that I like is no one hates us, everyone hates us and we don't care. I think that's fine. That's positive. But they've even nicked that from Millwall. <laughs> yeah, no, they yeah. stole that from they Millwall. Don't. And I think, to be fair, Millwall stole that from Leeds. That's also probably true. <laughs> that's also probably true. <laughs> but we beat them. And no, we, we, did. we may well be in the same division next year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which could be a very, yeah, their first very visit... Very... They have not yet. To, we've not yet played them as the home side. So no, that would be, be an interesting. Much fun to have to do hospitality. There probably won't be any hospitality. <laughs> in hospitality. <laughs> their own unique. Yeah, their own unique hospitality. Yeah, yeah definitely. Go to fat boys. <laughs> no, that's all right. Actually, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, and John, thanks very much. Just before we finish off, you mentioned that you're going to Syria now after today's game. So just talk about what what are you getting involved in over there. So it's the charity work that you're doing. Yeah, so we're going with the UN um, refugee agency to visit uh, with Syrian refugees who are living in Jordan, who are living in um, some who are living in camps. Although most of the refugees um, from the Syrian civil war who are living in Jordan live we, live in communities. They live in villages, and um, so we're going to be visiting with with some of them as well. And mostly just you know we're looking to hear their stories um, to find out. Uh, you know, what's, what's important to them, what their hopes are, uh, you know, just hear their stories and try to amplify those voices. Because I think one of the, one of the challenges that we have is that um, we're not hearing a lot directly from the refugee population, especially from women and girls um, who are sort of, I think, doubly silenced in this, Mm -hmm. in this problem. And right now, 65% of the uh, refugee Syrian refugees coming to Europe are, are women and girls, 
Um, so we want to, uh, yeah, try to try to hear those stories and then just amplify them. It should be a great visit. I'm really excited. And the UNHCR just does amazing work, um, not just with the Syrian refugee crisis, but with refugee crises all over the world from Burma to, uh, to the Central African Republic. So it's going to be a really, um, really cool trip. I feel really lucky to be able to do it. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be a vastly different experience from today. But, yeah. um, so I'm going to just try to really enjoy today and then get in that get in that mindset. Yeah. yeah. And is there anywhere anyone listening can find out more information about this? Yeah. So you, you can follow me on uh, on Twitter at John Green, um, and I'll I'll be posting lots. Um, but also follow the UN Refugee Agency. They're at Refugees uh, on Twitter, and it's a great um, great resource for sort of unbiased. Uh, explanations of the refugee crisis, understanding who's coming, why they're coming, where they're coming from, um, what their stories are, uh, so that, uh, you know, you can hear stories directly um, from refugees rather than hearing it from the BBC who may identify them as uh, migrants regardless of their refugee status. Sorry to be political there at the end. Loving the political end off. That was good. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. One of, one of the things that I wanted to say is that I think that ASU Wimbledon was the first uh, club in England to hold up a refugees welcome sign uh, at the very beginning of the sort of uh, refugee crisis uh, emerging in Europe. And I, uh, that says a lot to me about the club, and it made me very proud as a sponsor. We had a fantastic time interviewing John prior to the Oxford game. He was great company. You might have mentioned, or sorry, you might have heard him mention the name Rosiana in there as well. And Stu, I think we have to send a massive thank you to Rosiana, who works with John on many of his projects, who was actually key in setting up the interview with us this past Saturday. Yeah, just like, yeah, I'll, I'll just echo that really. Um, to be fair, trying to get an interview with um, John Green is not an easy thing. And um, we, for about three months ago, wasn't it? We sort of set out and thought, let's see if we can. And, um, we badgered him on Twitter. Every time he appeared on Twitter, we tried to get him involved. And um, I think we finally got him following us on the Merton Council decision. Yes, that, where famous, he, that famous night in Morden, yeah. Yeah, and he found he, um, we managed to hook him and get him to follow. And then same evening, he said, fancy a podcast. And Rosianna then took over. And um, yeah, she's been great. She's been really, really easy to talk to. You know, we tried to get a few bits and pieces and... Um, yeah, she was the one that approached us to get the interview. So really, really thank you very much. And um, John Green was everything and more that I thought he was a very intelligent gentleman and great fun. And he switched on about Wimbledon, which not well, I didn't think he'd know anything. I didn't think he would be clueless, but some of the stuff he mentioned, I was like, okay, you've done your um, you've done your homework. He he, yeah, you can tell he talks so passionately about this football club, and you can tell that we've really sort of. I say won him over, but he's fallen in love with us, really, hasn't he? You can tell that in the way he speaks about us. Oh, yeah, he, 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 he ultimately does love, does love us. Loves, he loves the first, he, I think he loves everything we stand for, and that, that really struck a chord when we were talking to him. But um, he's got, of course, he's an author, but he's got a great way of telling a story or describing things. I think, I think we can honestly say that I think we were... Um, not mesmerised, but we were. We we. It was a great forty-five minutes, and um, it didn't feel really much of a chore getting there early and um, and take the time out. It was just a perfect, perfect guest, and um, yeah, look forward to meeting him again when I'm sure he'll be over for the playoff final. I'm sure he will be over for the playoff final, Stu. We will see him at Wembley. Before we sign off as well, if Rosiana, just again, thank you very, very much. If you are interested, check out Rosiana's work. Follow her on Twitter at Paper Time Lady and search for her on YouTube as well, okay? Obviously, John Green, I'm pretty sure you'll know the details, but check us out. Check at John Green, at Sports with John as well on Twitter for updates from him. Thank you very much to the pair of them. Looking ahead then, very, very quick, Stu, we'll have a quick, very, very brief look ahead to the weekend's action. Bristol Rovers next Tuesday, we won't look at just yet, because obviously we don't know what's going to happen on Saturday when Achrington Stanley visit Kings Meadow. Yeah, I think I think it's safe to look at one game at a time, and you know Bristol will take care of itself. But Accrington, it's a weird one. I look, you know, obviously it's his chance for a double because we've done the four three beam at their place, which um, look at their form is not a bad not a bad four three win now, is it? Um, bearing in mind that was our debut of Ben Wilson, who could forget. Mr. Wilson's um, time with ourselves here, but yeah, 4-3 were up there. They're doing really well, but I still think 
I still sense that they're dropping out a little bit. Their form, their form is starting to you know, lost to Yeovil. So you can sense now that maybe I'm hoping that they're starting to feel the pressure. Um, we haven't got a great record at all against them, to be fair. I was looking at our head-to-head record, which I'm just going to quickly call back on now. But we've only won one game out of the last three or four we played them. No point playing them up there. Well, say that we just won the last game at the point, but um, the record up there was quite poor. But we sort of like killed that off with the victory early on. But really, it's going to be a tough game, and um, I'm just hoping that they 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 play in quite a few games. I know we are as well at the moment. But they started about a week earlier with the you know, Tuesday Saturday, so hoping that they are a little bit more fatigued than we are. Any other fixtures that catch your eye? On the weekend? It's not bad. It's not a bad weekend of football, to be fair. There's a lot of six-pointers coming up. Yeah. Um, spotted a massive one at the top of the table. And that would be... Plymouth-Oxford. Yeah. It's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I'd have probably said, you know what, that's, that's an interesting game. But Plymouth, by all accounts, lost two players um, on against Barnet. Um, trying to think now, one was, I think Blunt was one of them, and one was a low knee. But they're starting to pick up injuries, and I, I don't know if, I'm not going to say so, I told you so, but I remember a little while ago I was talking about their manager playing a little bit of a distress signal about talking about loans and why the emergency loan window is still open and teams should go along with what they've got. And it just felt to me he was a little bit feeling the, the pinch because of the squad size that he had. And um, I think Oxford will probably go and win that. I really do. I think if any team are catched well at the top three, Plymouth are the team that will be caught by somebody. I really do feel that. What other fixtures have caught your eye? Anything? Um, there's some interesting ones. Bristol Rovers going up to Notts County. Just the fact, obviously, we played them um, in midweek. I'm hoping Notts County can kick them. They definitely won't beat them, but obviously you could kick them a bit. <laughs> Sounds a bit wrong, doesn't it? Um, what else have we got? Um... Carlisle Northampton, that's the interesting one. I think Carlisle are decent. I had a surprise they had been laying on on Saturday, but um, it's Saturday, no, sorry, Tuesday, wasn't it, midweek? Yeah, Tuesday night, yeah. Sorry, I had them up there. But I think that's a that's a cracking game as well. Laying on Luton, um, that's decent. There's some decent ones there, to be fair, but I think your pick of them is Plymouth, Oxford. Um, but all the teams around us at the moment have got to keep getting the points and... Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it because no no real games are going to form massively, and there's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of unpredictable results happening. It's an moment. unpredictable season, isn't it? Across all the divisions, to be fair, yeah. um, unless Aston Villa are playing, which yeah. <laughs> fairly predictable. That one. Or, Dagger, or Dagger and Redbridge, who just don't seem to win at home at all. But don't worry, they've got us coming up soon. <laughs> when do they change their name from Dagenham and R- Richmond? <laughs> I know, I have to do a double check every time I call in how annoying him. I was speaking to a guy the other day actually on the train, he was going down to Dagenham and Richmond because he was the Lions person for the evening at one of their games. <laughs> so he was having, he, he, was a good, he was a good guy. Um, thank you very much to you. Updates from our, our games this week available as always on Twitter at 9YRS Podcast. Follow us on Facebook as well, 9YRS Podcast. Periscope app. And Instagram as well. All at that address, 9YRS Podcast. Teaser, Stu, did you have a, did you have an answer for it? No, I can think of, I know Sean North went there, didn't he, um, Bristol Ravers? I don't know if he was a caretaker there at some point. Well, I'm impressed you got that one, yeah. He, that yeah. is, yeah, well, I'm very impressed. And that was just purely because of the link of, um, I was always interested in what he'd done when he left the Twitter, yeah, with the three ones and stuff like that, and what he'd done. I can't think. I can't think who the manager at the time was. To be honest with you, can you remember who their current manager is? Who we played against earlier in the season, and obviously last uh, two seasons ago when they got relegated. Yeah, the current manager. Oh, I can't think of his face now. I know he's the one who got relegated, isn't he? So yeah. um, he was the ex Clark. He was the ex yeah. player, wasn't he? Ex player. Yeah. Um, they stuck by him, which is great because uh, not not many teams do when they get relegated. No, they did a good job there, Daryl Clark current manager. You're going to kick yourself with some of these names, Stu. John Ward was in charge before Daryl Clark. Oh, he's the old geezer, isn't he? Yeah, yes. That... Looked like a school teacher walking what down the touchline. Oh, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. No, but when he walked down the touchline, he looked like he had like, his, his like, pen and paper ready. He looked very like an old school teacher. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's a bit, you know, that's stereotype, Stu. That's right. <laughs> Just uh, have. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. 
Well, this is awkward now, isn't it? Uh, Paul Buckle was the first manager. Uh, Paul Buckle. Uh, yeah, fa- yeah, famously ex talkie famously quit his job at... Was it? Did he quit his job at Luton to go to the USA? I think he might have done. He did. Wasn't he seeing? Wasn't wasn't he um, seeing one of the um, Satanta or not Satanta? Yeah, but no, it was all ladies, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I can't remember her name though. Blonde girl. Yeah, she's now she's now BT Sport. I finished. Okay, I wouldn't I wouldn't know, but yeah, Paul Buckle and Mark McGee. Oh, yeah, husband of Debbie McGee. Debbie oh, McGee. No, actually, that might be a lie. <laughs> So there you yeah, go. I forgot about that. Yeah. Interesting. Love Thank it. you for a bit of a trivia on Bristol Rovers. Anytime. You are listening to the Bristol Rovers podcast. Stu, that's fantastic. We're actually going to finish the show slightly differently this week, only because we have a little bit, we have, we've got a little bit extra John Green to finish on this week. I'm sure the listeners will love this, okay? So we're going to get John Green to introduce the last feature of today's show. It's time for the birthdays game here on the Nine Years Podcast. How cool is that? John Green, actually, we gave him a list of things, a lot of sound bites to record for us. And he was a great sport, and he did them... Well, I say he did them all. There was one that he wasn't he wasn't too happy about. Hi, I'm John Green, co-founder of Nerdfighteria, and like most of the United Kingdom... I can't say I hate Watford. <laughs> <laughs> That's shit. <him. laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I hate Watford. My, my, so I have an across-the-street neighbour randomly in america who is a like he's a massive like from birth wanford fan oh, really? and yeah, when that's, uh, that's insult and when henry saying. was uh when <laughs> henry was one he snuck a wantford and <laughs> wantford bear into henry's crib <laughs> and henry still uh, has it and loves it because of course you give a baby something they get yeah. attached to it yeah. now i'm not sure Stu. i mean <laughs> Yeah, I know Like he's got the thing with his neighbour and stuff like that, but everybody hates Watford. Everybody does. There was a TV comedy show from America called... Oh, no, it was Everybody Hates Chris. But, you know, that's, no one likes Watford, <laughs> no matter what he says. The funny thing was is that you did, you did the sound bites, and you did. He, he, did, he did them all, and it was totally first, didn't it? You know, he, like I say, he, he's a great story, he, said, uh, he, bought, he brought all the sound bites to life, and... Um, really good and also just for a, a curveball in and just I can't say that and we were like oh that's not going to be good for Nick <laughs> uh, but his story was good wasn't it you know fancy fancy finding Waffle found out in Indianapolis it's um yeah it's a shame but he it's wouldn't say it would he it's hard enough to find a Watford fan in, in Watford <laughs> true true but there you go there was also one you say he brought them to life there was one that he added a little bit of extra on he ad libbed on and I think we can both say that we very much enjoyed this one Hi, I'm John Green, and when I watch Wimbledon play, I like to see them play in their traditional yellow and blue kit, or really anything other than the green on green stripes. Does that work? <laughs> that said, I'm going to buy one of those kits. They're so ugly. <laughs> but I want one. Like, I have a weird relationship with it. Where yeah, I'm it's, so, it's so bad it's good. Shirts. Yeah, they're, like, that bad, they're, they're, they're so horrible that you're like, I think I should get one. Now, in my head, as much as I love that, in my head, I, I, for some reason, I thought he'd said the word monstrosity or put it in a lot harsher terms than that. But safe to say, he, like myself, and I've tried to like it, Stu, just can't get on board with the green kit. Yeah, it's difficult. You know, I said in, you know, at the time, it, at the start of the season, I didn't really like it too much. We sold, we sold a lot of it. So there's obviously people like it, don't they? But I mean, probably, I mean, we've won a lot of games in it as well. So you have to probably say that either... There's a, a product camouflage, or just a look at a kit and think, really? Um, but it's so well. To be fair, John, he turned up, bless him, with his cap, woman and cap, scarf, and then went to the club shop and ended up buying everything, did he? He it was like, load, yeah. It was like, have that, have that, have that. And he really enjoyed it. And he, you know what? He, he generally, you know, he obviously spoke about that he was going to Jordan for the refugees, and that was just really great. And this was his layover. And he said a great layover. It was a great way of him enjoying the foot which he loves and then getting onto the serious business of what he, you know, the main trip was about. Um, he did enjoy his time though, and you probably noticed we put some stuff on Instagram and Twitter of him falling over, um, <laughs> getting up on stage. And John, I do apologise if you're listening, John. I do apologise. That was me that recorded it, and I did put it on there. But I just, um, you were such a good sport, and you had enjoyed yourself, having a good drink with the lads, and um, it was just nice to have a little bit of either saying you fell over 
Although normally we do say she fell over, but we were, we were kinder because it was you. He also very much enjoyed the birthdays game, but we're going to play that next week because they've got some birthdays for next week that we gave him. For this week, let's quickly run through them. Before we do two very, 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 very important birthdays, let's do one less important one. Celebrating on Wednesday. So yesterday, if you're listening to this on day of release on Thursday, was Harry Redknapp, former QPR, Tottenham, Portsmouth and West Ham account uh, manager. Sorry. <laughs> How old do you think he has to be? Harry Redknapp. Um... Yeah, he's one of your favourite numbers. <laughs> He's older than what? Yeah, he's... He must... Yeah, he's must... He must be late 50s. Possibly in the 60s now. I'm going to go for... I think he might be in the 60s. Maybe wrong. 62. He's almost 70. He's 69. Wow. I know. I was trying to think back of when he was uh, manager at Bournemouth. I remember they had an FA Cup run. I was trying to work in my head the sort of centuries that he not centuries but <laughs> these centuries feels like centuries but you know, the tens of years that he'd been involved but crikey 69 he's done well, well. he's done well. well yeah well done mate well done what about this one Stu podcast star and football pundit Stuart Deacons he <laughs> celebrates his birthday on Saturday I've got to guess how old I am. You've got to, well, yes. And do you know what, listeners? You might think this is silly, Stu trying to guess how old he is. If you know Stu, I'm not sure he does know. I'm not sure if he's aware. To be fair, I'm sure I stopped counting off my 30th birthday, to be fair. <laughs> so that's why I don't remember too much, because once you get past 30, there's not really much to look forward to, because you have a midlife crisis. And then you, and it's, and for all those people that are around my sort of age and support women for a length of time, I now get quite depressed when I look at the programme. And I see the rewind section, and I remember the 20 years ago as if it was yesterday. That yeah. Is, yeah, that is scary. That's the old age. My, girl, my, sorry, my girlfriend, my fiance, the rain now, she's got up to five years, and she's ecstatic. I don't watch the play. I don't look at that page anymore. It may be a great page, but I just don't want to celebrate 20 years of thinking I'm proper old. So that's my rant gone. Um, I am 41 on. Saturday. Well, Stu, I think, see, I think you've got yourself confused. Because by some quirk of fate, it is also my birthday on Saturday. No. It is. But Stu, and by some, a further quirk of fate, we are producing the Nine Years podcast, and there is nine years between your age and mine. Therefore, as I am only 24, you can only be 33. <laughs> are you trying to claim you're that young? <laughs> well... Have you seen my birth certificate? No. Then prove me wrong. To be fair, there's a lot of players that they've not seen their birth certificate for. No. <laughs> Let's not go down that route again. <laughs> We're talking about ex-Portsmouth and Middlesbrough strikers. <laughs> yeah. See, as you know, if I am... If I am 24... I am 24. Okay. This does mean if I was born in 1992... Which means I completed my degree at the age of 13. Therefore, I am a child prodigy. Oh, dear. Either that or my maths is distinctly out and I'm actually 32. But let's not, <laughs> let's ignore that. It's quite good though, Stu, because I age at the same age as WrestleMania. How good is that? Spot on. And also, it's nice that our birthday is on the day of a football match. And we have Accrington Stanley. Yes. Well, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better opponent to celebrate. Woohoo. What's up? Exactly, and if they come and they take a three points, I'm going to let their tyres down on the team coach. Do they have tyres? They're from, like, Lancashire. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Of course, I wouldn't do that because that'd be vandalism and I'd get banned from football. Just in case, by some quirky nature, that does happen. Um, that, of course, was not me. I think the podcast has gone overboard. I think we're both too tired. When we listen back to this tomorrow, we're going to be like, Did we, what, why are we talking about... Vandalising Accrington Stanley coach. Why? And people I might, don't know. People might think that every week with me talking about wrestling, to be fair. But in all seriousness, Accrington Stanley is a great, great little club. Does the best pies at the ground. It's actually not the ground. There's a pub just behind. Does the best pies. And um, I don't want them to get promoted. I don't think they should, they should get promoted. Or if they do, they should get promoted with us. And then we can both enjoy the pies next year. <laughs> Do you realise you're still talking? I oh, know. 
<laughs> let's just leave it on that. Stu's going to sign off with that sentiment. Let's hope we both enjoy the pies next year. <laughs> And on that note, listeners, I'll say thank you very much for joining us this week. Thank you very much to John Green and Rosianna as well. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at 9YIS Podcast, Instagram, Periscope as well. And join us next week where we will be joined by Eric Samuelson as we go hunting for non-attending season ticket holders and we shall be burning them at the stake. We'll see you then.